You're listening to episode 82 of the Style and Stewardship Podcast. So in this episode, I'm talking about a few things that I think are really, really crucial for our health and our wellness, and that is to really define what it means to eat healthy and what healthy food even is. So I think it's really important that we know what that is before we're approaching any sort of wellness journey so that we're on the right right track. But I also want to just, just say this really quickly. I was super stuffy as I was recording this episode. So if you can give me a little grace and get past that, I think that you will get a lot out of this episode. I struggle with um, histamine intolerance and it was going crazy when I recorded this, but I didn't want to not upload. So just ignore that I sound a little stuffy and I hope that you get a lot out of this episode. What does it actually mean to eat a healthy diet? What does it mean to actually be healthy? I think that many times these things, because they are not defined, they end up getting lost in the sauce. (laughs) They end up getting lost because it's like, if we don't know what it means to be healthy and we're just flippantly throwing that word around or, um, you know, we're just assumptively throwing that word around we might be that might be most of the reason why we're missing out on what it means to be healthy and how to be healthy and I think that that's most people right now there's so much out there and there's so many voices including mine you know I'm, I'm helping I, my hope is that I can help you discern what healthy means for you um, and healthy what healthy means for just people humans our bodies our physiology and our biology, the way that God has made us. And because of all these voices, we have to understand that before we had media, before we had scientists, before we understood what a gram of fat was or nutrition facts were or how many grams of sugar was in something, we ate with something that is way more powerful than even knowing those things. And that is, we ate very purposefully. Now we are eating not purposefully and intentionally for our sustenance. Now we're eating for pleasure, which, you know, hey, God gave us taste buds. I always say that. He wants us to enjoy food, I believe. And all good things that he's created in the right context. Okay, I had to say that. Um, Also, we ate things that were in season. We were eating for convenience. And I think that that's a huge distinction that we have to keep in our minds. And since we are living in a modern world, there are certain things that we actually have to in my opinion, in my beliefs, is harken back to. Like, we need to listen to that traditional way that of eating, of, of realizing what food is and what food does. And I believe that we've gotten so far away from that that it's really, really the best thing for us to do is to go backwards in order to go forward and what I mean by that is to start comparing what we used to eat what people ate centuries ago or even just a century ago compared to what we're eating now and my husband was telling me about um, Jack Lane. I don't know if you've ever heard that name but I remember my granny watching some of his infomercials and Jack LaLanne would say if it grows from the ground or if it came from the earth i.e. plants animals fruit you know all the things if it came from a man's hand to spit it out that's what he would say Because he saw the beginning of this influx that we currently live in. It's kind of prophetic, right? Of what food, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, 
food-like substances is what we are consistently consuming. Many of us are not consuming real food. And, and the difference is when we're eating real food, not only are we getting the real nutritional value, even though the source does matter, which also that's another tradition, right? We have turned into factory farms and, and you know, fish farms and all of these things that, yes, it is convenient for companies, which makes it um, more convenient for us, but it does not make it convenient to our health and our wellness. So back in the day, what did they do to preserve things? They canned things. Um, they salt, you know, cured certain things like meats and, you know, fish. And still in other countries, you will find things like this. If you go to, um, I have, you know, friends from all over the world, really. But that was the beauty of, you know, being a New Yorker. You had friends from everywhere where and it's just, uh, it's beautiful. And I love that. But anyways, um, they had things like fish that was sitting out. They would go to the market and just buy it because it was salt cured. Or things that were dehydrated. Or things that were canned. And don't get me wrong. I love having things that are in the freezer. I love the freezer. Because I don't know how to salt cure anything. And um, But you would buy dried herbs and spices. And all of these things that you can still do. When you go to other countries that are not westernized. Um, or you know industrialized as much as we are. To this extent that are still eating their indigenous foods. And their real and all of these things have the same thing in common, whether you're talking about people in Africa or you're talking about people in Australia or you're talking about people in Asia or you're talking about people in South America. Well, I can name all the continents everywhere. There is a way of eating that people did that was passed down from generation to generation. And the way that people ate things is very, very different than what we do. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a farm. <laughs> um, and you know, I am a, a, a modern woman, I would I would like I would say in many ways. And I like convenience because of all the different things. And as we became a more industrialized society, which, you know, that innovation brought in some really great things, but it made us less and less reliant on agriculture to come from our own hands and, you know, not having our own, you know, family farm or um, a a garden outside. You know, my grandmother was one of, what, six children? I can't remember. Six? I think it's six. Yeah, my grandmother is one of six children and they, um, her father, you know, built their house with his own two hands, you know, this two-bedroom house and I'm sorry three-bedroom house one two I digress three-bedroom house with his own two hands and you know he bought a little piece of land and so, you know other family members bought other pieces from him and you know they were in the south that house is still there still standing strong and they had a garden in the back and I'll never forget it. I would come down south with my granny and they would, my great grandmother, breakfast was a big deal. Let me tell you. Um, <laughs> and the reason why I was thinking about this and the reason why their breakfast was a big deal was because they were going to be outside working for most of the day. You know, they got their living by working with their hands and their backs. You know what I mean? And because of this, they had a certain respect for what it took to have a garden and, and, and have some of their own food. They actually, um, the things that we so easily get, they had to work a lot harder for. And I think that sometimes convenience can cloud our judgment. It sometimes cloud our respect for what it takes for something to be produced. And since we can just go to a vending machine and pop out whatever we want or through a drive through and order whatever we want, we don't have that connection of what it costs other than financially 
and um, let's talk about it um, health wise too but we don't have that connection of food that we once did and I'm not saying like we all need to go and get on a farm and become an agricultural society again but I am saying that regardless of the conveniences that we come up with or the industrialized innovations that come we come up with you know tomorrow real food still needs to be produced and someone is producing it so we're not at the the point where we can just you know we're not the Jetsons yet right I don't know if you you know what that cartoon is but back in the day we had a, a cartoon called the Jetsons and we also had a cartoon called the Flintstones growing up but one of my favorite movies side note was like the Flintstones meet the Jetsons I love that movie so much but anyways so they used to just pop out you know they were super innovative right they lived in in the sky they had flying cars and all of these things if you as crazy and as far-fetched as it was when I was a kid we're not far from any of those things as a matter of fact they already have people lining up to get this flying car which no one can even drive yet because so many things have to be anyways ironed out as far as I mean, anyways, I'm going to go on a side note. Let me get back on track. So the more disconnected we are from our food, the less we understand it, respect it, and appreciate it for the most part. We eat out of, you know, boredom. We eat out of, com you know, wanting comfort. We eat out of entertainment. But back in the day, they ate out of need for sustenance because they were going to go out and do really, really hard work. And I'm not saying we don't do hard work. As a matter of fact, our brain <laughs> burns through a whole lot of calories, especially when we're in deep thought or if we are feeling anxious or anything like that. So I'm not saying that because we're using our hands less for the most part, that we're not also still using some form of energy that we, you know, we're, we're needing to burn energy, right? The human body needs energy 24 seven, even while sleep, right? So back to my grandmother and the way that they grew up. So breakfast was a big deal. And I would, I'll never forget this. And mind you, these were things that I don't I didn't eat then and I still don't necessarily eat now, but I appreciate it now. I get it now. Um, and I did it then. So my great granny would get up and make breakfast. And breakfast, I would wake up to the smell of all the things that were delicious in the southern and she would make salmon patties or salmon croquets <laughs> I still make those to this day um, I make them a little different now but salmon patties she would make um, stone ground grits that had to cook for like an hour and it had butter and and, and cream and different things in it um, and she would also make eggs, bacon, and this was like their typical breakfast. Eggs, bacon, salmon patties. Oh, I forgot liver mush. That's something that people eat in the South. I still have not touched it. Um, <laughs> I don't think that I will ever just because I just can't. There's certain things, you know, you just can't eat and that's one of the things for me and I'll never forget my uncle would go out my, my great uncle my grandmother's baby brother would go outside and he would bring in cantaloupe tomatoes and sometimes cucumbers out of their backyard garden and they would slice the tomatoes they would slice the cu the cantaloupe and they would slice the cucumbers and you would have this at the side of your breakfast. And when I say you were full after breakfast, you were full after breakfast. <laughs> like you were not, you were not hungry after you ate this breakfast for hours. On Fridays, um, all the guys would go and fish and whatever they fished for, they would come back with, with a cooler. They would, you know, clean them all outside and then literally 
all the cousins would come around and they had this thing that no kidding it looked like a cauldron that sit, that sat outside and they would have a big giant thing of oil and they would bread all the fish and they would deep fry it and then my great granny or someone would have some sort of cornmeal flour mix baking powder you know the you know what i'm talking about hush puppies and they would drop those in there and sometimes they'd buy buy like the big bag of like fries whatever store brand fries and that is what they ate like and you would just stand there with a plate <laughs> and you would get your food and then after they were done they would spend like an hour not kidding making banana or peach whichever fruit they had around ice cream and they had the bucket with the salt and the ice and some we would take turns churning it and this to me you know I'm in New York you know I'm from Queens and I came down here and I saw this I'm used to getting a slice of pizza you know a Jamaican beef patty or chicken patty with some cocoa bread you know I'm, I'm used to eating jerk chicken I'm used to eating Chinese food, all these things from all these different cultures at the speed of light because nothing closed and everything delivered. This is before DoorDash. That's just being a New Yorker or if you're from L.A. or any big city, you know what I'm talking about. In New York, you can literally order anything any time of day and it could be delivered to you. And I came down here and I had to wait for my food, right? I had to watch somebody labor over it and work for it. And can I just tell you, it was some of the best food that I had ever had. And I was so, I was always looking forward to the food down south because it was, for most, all intents and purposes, it was a food that I, I didn't have anything like that in New York, you know, unless my granny made it. But the experience of everybody pitching in and cooking and, and making the food, and this wasn't like just women cooked or just men cooked. It was like everybody was pitching in and doing this this food and when you feasted it that's what it felt like it felt like you enjoyed this food that literally you knew where it came from you know minus the oil and you know stuff like that but you know and, and I remember my great granny would keep this can on the the stove and it was literally just collected bacon fat that she would keep on the stove after she was done, you know, cooking breakfast, which she always made in cast iron. And I don't know if it was a Southern thing or what, but all her pots were pretty much cast iron. And she had like casserole dishes that were made out of glass or ceramic. And she used anchor, um, um, anchor or corning ware, things like that. And that was just, I, I remember so many special occasions where you know obviously food was involved and I don't think there's anything wrong with that because I read scripture and there's a whole lot of feasts going on and they were always you know celebrations to for so many different reasons and I think that that's still something that's very whether people follow God or not it's something that God has placed in all of us we like to commune around food and we like to get together around food and Thanksgiving is a perfect example of that where people celebrate that and they're not giving thanks to God. <laughs> they're just, you know, celebrating a quote unquote holiday of Thanksgiving. Um, well, we get around and we, we do Thanksgiving. We're, you know, we're, you know, praising God for what he's done. And I believe every time we eat, that is really what that's, that's pretty much our hearts, right? When we're asking God to bless the food to nourish our bodies that we're about to eat, we're thanking him for it. Right. So, I say all of these different things to say, to make the point that eating healthy is not something that is a man-made determinant. Eating healthy is something that your body will tell you that you are doing. Eating well is something that your body will physiologically tell you that you are doing by having good energy, by being able to sleep well by having balance in your body. And a lot of times we're sick or we're feeling bad because we are eating in a way that is not 
balanced. In many terms, it's because we are eating things out of convenience and not necessarily out of respect for what we're eating. You know, when we when we go to someone else's house or when we eat with someone else, we always, you know, when we're praying, it's like, God, and please bless the hands that prepare this food. A lot of us can't even say that <laughs> anymore. It's like um, the machine that made this food or the factory. And I'm not saying like factories are wrong or bad or anything like that. I think that they're a great innovation. However, when we are using innovation to take the place in laboratory work and in um, factory farming to take the place of real food, then I'm saying, um, you know, that's what we really need to get away from. I rarely speak to someone who is having issues in their wellness, issues in their body, you know, balance, you know, their body's not being balanced and things like that, that are not consuming lots of man-made products. I see very few, and it's the reason why people get are so attracted to veganism, right? Because you're like, oh, well, people have found this perfect diet and this perfect template to, to eat. Um, and this must be the way that we're all supposed to eat. And the fact of the matter is, is most people are not eating <laughs> much real food. And anytime you switch from any diet, I don't care what diet you try from a standard American diet, sad diet, where you're eating mostly processed foods, high in carbohydrates and sugars and, you know, sunflower oil, and safflower oil, and corn oil and um, canola oil and all of these things. You switch from French fries and all of that. You switch from that to any whole foods diet where you're eating mostly whole real food. You're going to feel better. I don't care what it is. Like it could be carnivore. It could be vegan. It could be. What's the other word? Raw vegan. It could be uh, Mediterranean. It could be anything where you're switching from the standard American diet or any highly processed food diet, food like <laughs> substance diet to a whole real food diet, you're going to feel better. You're going to physiologically have better outcomes in your health because you have gone from eating these really processed foods that the body has to do something with, which a lot of times leads to inflammation and all types of disease, right? To real food that actually has bioactive components in it, you are going to feel better. So when it when we think about what it means to be healthy or how to be healthy, we have to take all of those things into account. Are we eating real food is the first question. The second question is what's in the food that I'm about to eat? How is it produced? Because that definitely matters. We eat sick animals. We get sick ourselves. And that's why so many of those documentaries are so popular because you're taking the worst of the worst, which is farm raised animals that are completely against the way that animals are even supposed to be eating, i.e. giving cows, force feeding cows corn, right? Or shooting them up with antibiotics or putting it in their feed so that they are constantly um, producing milk and keeping them pregnant after pregnancy after pregnancy so that they continue to produce milk or giving them artificial hormones to trick their body so that they continue to produce milk. All of these things that we're doing are why those things that we see in documentaries are so powerful because we're all disgusted by it, where cows are standing in their own feces, literally. Um, I should probably do a disclaimer whenever I do a podcast because I'm going to talk about something that is um, gross but true. And whenever we're eating just that regular pack of ground beef or just that, you know, that steak from the grocery store or that chicken or whatever... We're not taking these things into account. We're not thinking about uh, thinking about these things. We're not thinking about the detriment that it's having to our health. And we're eating sick food. So if we're eating sick animals, we will 
what are we? We are what we eat, right? And we literally are, right? Every part of our DNA, there are DNA is protein strands, right? We're we're protein, amino acids. So every it's literally the the building blocks of our cells, of our bodies, everything. And it's no secret that when we eat things that are are sick. I mean, or, or, I mean, just take, we don't even have to talk about animals. If we are going to eat food that is rancid, right, has mold growing on it, we expect to get sick. But when we're eating things that are worse than mold, <laughs> um, which mold is pretty bad, but we're eating things that it's in its most, degenerate state what why do we not expect to get sick we and, and i think that that's the 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 assumption is that even though we have this industrialized society and this food farmed system we have the disconnect but we also have a belief that somehow when you pick up the, the, the package of margarine and it has a little farm picture on the outside, we assume, and, and they do this through marketing, right? We assume that it's healthy or we see a green leaf on something and it says whole grain and we're like, oh, well, this is good for me. Um, or we see something that says 65% uh, less saturated fat and we see um, a, a farm animal on it. It gives us the illusion that we're eating well or that we're eating real food but the truth is is we're not so by real food i mean food that's actually going to be beneficial to our body on every level the cellular level our physiology our biology and all of the different things that have to work in our bodies so that we are well and that we we can feel well right Everything that we eat is not food. And I say this all the time. Everything that's edible is not food, period. I can eat, a, a, I can go outside right now and eat a stick. And my body will actually try to digest this and break this down because our bodies have these functions that God created them to do. And it's going to do that. We, our body is, is, is expecting food. So it's going to create, you know, those gastric juices are going to, you know, be secre secreted. Our enzymes are going to be secreted. And we are, our body's going to try to break down that stick that we just ate from outside. Just because I ate it doesn't mean that it's food. And I think that when we keep focusing on a particular diet to be well, or um, a particular way of eating to be well, we're going to miss the point. We're not going to be well, and we're not going to... Um, we're still not going to have the relationship that a lot of us really need to have again with our food. I know people who can't cook or don't want to cook. That's only an industrialized society issue. That's a first world problem. You go anywhere else. If I put you in the woods right now, in the middle of nowhere, you had to fend for yourself. You would never say, I can't cook. You would say, I need to find something so that I can eat. But because of our convenience, we have gotten so far away from that. I haven't experienced this, but I I was told, especially with people um, that, I, that, I, that I'm friends with that grew up in the southern states. And they were like, you know, we had something called home ec. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> and they had things like, you know, even my, my husband said that they, I think they stopped it by the time um, he was in, I don't know, ninth grade, something like that. But they had things like shop in woodwork, woodworking shop. I think that might be the same thing. I don't know. I think shop was mechanical woodworking. I digress. But they had things like home ec and all of those things. And these were actual, when ki like kids going to school and actually learning things that benefited them in their life. Right? That's important. We all need to know how to cook. We all need to know how to at some point, you know, 
grow something. <laughs> we all need to know how to boil water and maybe put an egg in there, fry an egg. So when people say that they can't cook, it's because they're so used to a life of convenience. Think about that. That's a luxury. Convenience back in the day was a luxury afforded to rich people where other people cooked for them. Now we have this skewed view that we don't, you know, a lot of us don't know how to cook and we're okay with that. Why are we okay with that? That's not okay. I'm like, I take my son with me in the kitchen and I show him how to crack an egg. I show him how to, you know, I let him help me mix things when I'm making like the um, oat muffins or, you know, banana nut bread or whatever. I let him see the process for several reasons. One of them being he needs to know that someone took effort to make this food. And now we have a society where our kids are sitting around typically on their phones um, and they're waiting for food to be brought to them. And they go in the kitchen, when's dinner ready? When's dinner ready? When's dinner, dinner ready? And back in the day, and depending on what your family background is, I don't know, I can't make this assumption for everyone, but you had to at least get plates <laughs> when it was time to eat. You had to get the forks and the knives out. You had to pour drinks if, you know, maybe there was lemonade like my great granny. Like you had to do something in that kitchen. You were going to contribute. And many times we, our kids are not doing that. It's almost like, oh, um, someone's going to ring the bell. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, food's going to be brought out to you. We're eating food in front of our TVs. It's not even communal anymore. That's why Thanksgiving is even a bigger deal for a lot of people. Because sometimes it's the only time they sit down at a table to eat their food. All of this I'm saying for one major point. We have to question what it means to be healthy. What it means to eat healthy. What healthy food actually is. And when we can start to ask those questions, our health will be so much better for it. Think about that. When's the last time you ate real food? When's the last time your kids helped you or at least had to sit in the kitchen and watch you cook so that they understood there is effort in this, and it's not just because I'm driving up to a window and presto, I have food. Or I went to a vending machine and presto, a sandwich came out. I went to the QT and presto, you know, I took a hot dog and put it on a bun and someone else cooked this. We have no relationship towards food outside of pleasure sometimes and entertainment. And the more we can get back to real food, the literal healthier we will be. Our bodies are screaming for nourishment and it's doing it in the form of inflammation, of disease, of sickness, of frailty, of lack of energy, of chronic, like migraines, constant stomach issues, indigestion, acid reflux, Hives, itching, sneezing, sleepless nights, energy crashes. I can go on and on and on. And I hope you're getting the picture that I'm trying to paint. <laughs> know that every day and every meal is a new opportunity to give our bodies what it needs for fuel and for its well-being. I encourage you to think about that. Approach food with a respect. Because without it, where are we? And God has given us so many things to freely enjoy. However, we are not supposed to be unwise, but wise in all things. So think about that.
if this encouraged you, if this got you thinking, I would love to hear from you. You can send me email, hello at styleandstewardship.com with the subject line pod or pod questions. You can also leave a review on any of your favorite podcast apps that helps other people find this. And you can always just share this with someone who you think needs to get a hold of their health and their wellness so that they can be well. That's my intention. That is my goal with this podcast. My hope is that you will learn and that you'll grow. You'll be inspired, challenged, and encouraged to really steward your wellness on purpose with intention. And as I always say, until next time, your life matters. What you do with it matters. So what will you steward well?